Hello for our first semester. So our speaker today is uh, Misha Kazdan from the uh, Computer Science Department here in Hopkins. Uh, really briefly, I think some of you might know him already. Uh, so uh, Misha is uh, got his PhD from Princeton in Computer Science, and he has been uh, is a professor in, uh, in Computer Science Department. Now. Uh, so his work is not in deep learning. Or shape analysis, uh, 3D modeling, and uh, okay, computational geometry. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so please stay. Uh, Sorry, uh, it's not all about deep learning. And so today, he's tell us about his work on uh, Mobius uh, registration. Thank you, Nicholas. It's, it's a great honor to be here and uh, talking to you guys. Um, so I want to talk to you about work uh, that we did recently, uh, PhD student Alex Vaden and his name Crane from CMU, on Mobius registration. Um, and I'm going to start off by sort of motivating this by something that I've worked on maybe 20 years ago when I was a graduate student. We were looking at registering shapes, we were looking very simple, we were just looking for rigid registration. When you're looking at registra rigid registration, you're trying to match up two shapes, uh, find the rigid re registration that best aligns. And there's two components, right? There's the translation part, you want to find the translation, and the rotation part. Now, if I asked you to take two shapes and find the translation that best aligns them, uh, what would you do? Take the mean. Take the mean. So you would take the center of mass of one and move it to the center of mass of the other. Perfect. And you can actually show that under some definition of deformation, for example, if you have a volume preserving deformation, this would give you the optimal uh, translation, regardless of, say, uh, which bijection or which definition. How about if you were trying to align things for rotation? What would you do then? Procrustes, if you have correspondences. What if you don't have correspondences? PCA. PCA. PCA will fail. Uh, PCA, because you can always take a shape and scale it, apply an anisotropic scale, so there's covariance matrix, the identity. In which case, there are no principal axes. There's nothing to glom onto. But I think. Nicolas very full norm and I minimize it on the rotation which is just probably not the best. Okay, no, okay. <laughs> what what hopefully and this this is sort of a question we were thinking about even then, even twenty years ago, is it was clear translations are easy. In fact, translations are even easier than what Nicolas said, uh, because what you can do is you can take every shape and just translate it so its own center of masses at the origin. You don't even have to look at pairs of shapes. You can you know, canonically pose things with respect to translation. Rotation is hard. And so the questions we're looking at are twofold. One is now, is there something about rotations that makes it fundamentally harder than translations? Uh, and if they are fundamentally harder, why is that the case? So we'll answer the second one. We won't answer the first one. Uh, but we will sort of give a hint as to why rotations might be substantially harder. Uh, if you're thinking it has to do with commutativity, the same issue would hold if I gave you 2D curves instead of 3D surfaces. The same problem would hold. You still have the same problem that translations trivial with center of mass, rotations are. So that, that's sort of what this talk is going to end up being about. We didn't know that this was what's going to happen, but that's what it's going to be about. Okay, good. So <clears throat> you have uh, shapes, and the natural thing you would want to do them with them, if they're similar shapes, is to register them, to establish some sort of mapping or correspondence between them. Uh, you use this if you want to do shape matching to say if they're similar, but if you want to do, even if you want to do more complicated stuff, establishing correspondences, transferring information, working on collections of data sets, and trying to do sort of consistent segmentation, these are all things. Uh, that you would need to establish a registration for. In this case, I'm not looking specifically at rigid registration, I just, some sort of registration. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about what that is. Uh, what makes this hard? Uh, so I think two things make this hard. Uh, in the world of, sort of in computer graphics and geometry processing, uh, there's, first of all, there's a question of how you represent your mesh. Right? There's no canonical way to represent the surface. We typically triangulate. You can use a twisted function, you can use something else. But even, let's say, Let's say you do decide to triangulate, there's no reason that you're going to triangulate the same surface in the same way. So there's no even natural sort of correspondence between the vertices on the bunny on the top and the bunny on the bottom. This is, by the way, the Stanford bunny. If you're in computer graphics, the Stanford bunny is required to appear in it. Some slide of any talk you give. This is a rule. Um, the other problem is, right, we're not interested just in rigid transformations, we're interested in a wider class of transformations. Things that, you know, if you deform the bunny, if you turn its gear sideways, it somehow hasn't changed the bunny, how you match across this. So what's the approach that's been proposed? Uh, the approach that's been 
proposed is to try and get a representation of your shape over some canonical base domain. Uh, and so one of the things that people have looked at, uh, what's been very popular, I think even in your community it's been popular, is to look at conformal parameterizations, mappings of your surface to the sphere, bijections from the sphere to your surface, uh, that preserve angles. Have you guys seen this before? Well, let me show you a visualization of what this looks like. So here is our bunny again, um, and what I'm going to show you over here is you should be able to see. Let me just turn off the lights because it's distracting. You can see the triangulation. The triangulation, just like in the image, is pretty nice. Roughly, uh, right? Uh, what do we have? Roughly 60 degree angles at all the angles. And so, uh, so this is one particular form of computing a conformal parameterization to the sphere. It's called conformalized mean curvature flow. Uh, you adapt mean curvature flow to do just a little bit different, uh, something just a little bit different. And it turns out that when you run this, you get this evolution that takes your surface uh, to the sphere. Uh, and what, I, what do I want you to notice? So first of all, in terms of the color scheme, we started off with some color scheme on the initial mesh. That's being captured, sort of I'm mapping that to the sphere so you can sort of see where things are. These are the bunny's eyes, the ears, the nose. Um, and so if we look at this gun, let's zoom in a little bit. So there's the bunny. Um, uh, and we can we can zoom in. And what you're seeing is that the ears are really collapsed, right? They're going down to a really small area. There's the ear, the, just the tip of the ear right there. It takes a while to find it. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Right? It's, it's going to this tiny point on the sphere. Let's see. Go. And you can see the triangulation. Right? The triangles, the angles in the triangles are preserved. This is a conformal parameterization, so it preserves the angles on the triangles. So the, these, we had this isotropic triangulation before with roughly equilateral triangles. We still have them now, but what's clearly happening is area is not preserved. This is sort of what conformal parameterization or conformal mapping does. It preserves angles. It doesn't preserve, uh, doesn't preserve areas. Good. So, there we go. All right. That's good. We've seen it. Good. Um, so this is good because it gives us a mapping of our geometry, assuming g is zero, which is all we're going to talk about today, to canonical domain, in this case, a sphere. For every point on the sphere, we have a mapping uh, that tells us where it came from on the surface. Um, and in fact, if you're looking at deformations that preserve isometry, isometric structure, uh, it has this property, it has this nice property that uh, you'll get the same parameterization. That uh, if you have an isometric deformation of your shape, if I took the bunny and somehow isometrically deformed it, I would get exactly the same parameterization over the sphere. So that's good. So I get something that sort of mods out uh, by this deformation, almost. Um, also, it's it's not clear that in the discrete case there is such a thing as an isometry preserving transformation. Uh, I, think that, I think there's work that says it doesn't actually exist for discrete surfaces, but we'll let that stand. But this is. But even for closed surfaces, I'm not sure that there are. Uh, for closed surfaces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you take like a cylinder with a, with a cone on top, you can pop the cone in, for example, right? That'll be an isometric differential. Uh, it's not smooth. Huh? I don't know. It's not smooth. Uh, I mean, let's put it this way. As, as manif Ramanian manifolds, these two things are isometric. There's no dis distortion in the metric. You can find a manifold that completely preserves. But there's a problem. And the problem is, I'm looking at conformal maps. Conformal maps are maps that preserve <coughs> angles, but not areas, necessarily. And I'm mapping to the sphere. Well, the problem is that there are maps from the sphere into itself that are conformal. Right? So if I say I get a mapping that's you know, conformally invariant, that's only unique up to 
the maps of the sphere to itself that preserve uh, angles. And these are, this is the Mobius group. And the Mobius group uh, consists really of two parts. Uh, first of all, rotation. Obviously, if I take a sphere and I rotate it, that transformation doesn't change the notion of angles on the sphere. So already I'm getting parameterization over the sphere of my surface that's only unique up to rotation. But there's actually a second component to this, another three-dimensional, uh, three degrees of freedom, which is inversions. These are operations that you can apply to spherical maps that deform it in a non-rigid way, but still preserving angles, right? So here we have this head over here, and I've done something to it. You can see that the head is getting smaller over here. Angles are still preserved, uh, but, uh, but rigidity is not. And so we have this group of transformations that take, takes the sphere to itself, these Mobius transformations. And so when we map a surface to the sphere, we're going to get a mapping that is only unique up to Mobius transformations. That's the only thing we can guarantee. And so if we want to use these conformal parameterizations over the sphere to do stuff like registration, uh, we need to be able to register over the Mobius transformations. That is to say, we have these two parameterizations over a spherical domain. We need to find the Mobius, the element of the Mobius group that puts them into correspondence. We need to search over the space of the Mobius transformations. So that's going to be what this talk is about. It's going to be how do you do Mobius registration? And we'll separately look at these two components. We start off with two shapes. They're conformally mapped, each is conformally mapped to the sphere independently. Uh, we will talk about handling the inversion part, and it will show, just like for translations with rigid motions, that you can sort of canonically pose each individual shape with respect to inversions. And then, just like for rigid transformations, rotations are harder, and that requires some sort of alignment between pairs of parameterizations. So that's what we're going to do there. Uh, this work, the stuff that I'm going to describe, uh, aspects of this have been described before. If you're working in the computational geometry world, um, you may want to try and map a polytope, a convex polyhedron, to, uh, to a sphere. Uh, but it turns out uh, there are many applications, there are applications in which you want this mapping to the sphere uh, up to Mobius transformation, but you want to somehow find a nice canonical representation. So there is this notion of trying to find the transformation that puts the center of the vertices of this polytop at the origin. This is very closely related to what we're going to describe. We're going to take a very different approach from Springboard. Um, I think as a result, we get a much simpler algorithm, and we get one that generalizes in ways that hopefully will be exciting to you. Uh, for rotation, we'll just do straight, straight up signal processing. Nothing particularly fancy here. If you haven't seen it, you haven't seen it. Yeah. Uh, OK, so you guys are ready. And I'm told, you, well, I should tell you if, you, if you have questions, if there's confusion about what I'm saying along the way, feel free to interrupt me. Just a question. So, is, so once you do the main curvature flows do, this, will you get a singularity on that point? Uh, you, uh, so what do you mean? Like this. Is. So main curvature flow will create singularities. Yes. It creates neck, neck pinch singularities if you're working with non-convex shapes. Right? But will so this cause a problem? No. So we're doing not main curvature flow. We're doing something else called conformalized main curvature flow. And while we don't have a proof that this doesn't form singularities, empirically we have found that this works all the time. Okay. Uh, this, this is an interesting question to which we don't have an answer. Uh, we just don't. Uh, we would like somebody else to answer this question for us. We'd be very curious to know whether in fact it's supposed to work. Um, okay. So we need to talk about what is an inversion. Rotation, as you guys are, I'm assuming, reasonably comfortable with. So what's an inversion? Uh, so I'm going to look at this in the context of a circle instead of a sphere uh, and talk about defining inversions. But I can talk about an inversion as a map in a circle to itself. But what I really am going to do is I'm going to do it a different way. I'm going to talk about a circle lives in two-dimensional space. We can talk about inversions of two-dimensional space and then see what it does to the circle. That's, that's what we're going to do. And um, we know what the conformal maps the Mobius group is on the complex plane. These are the fractional linear transformations. And in this case, inversions are essentially the map that takes a point P to the point P over P squared, or over the norm of P squared. So P is inside the unit circle. It goes outside of the unit circle. It's outside the unit circle. It goes in. Infinity goes to the origin. Origin goes to infinity. Um, and a unit circle gets mapped to itself. There is a conjugation term if you're very technical, but we will ignore this. So this is an inversion. Uh, and it has the property that if you have a circle and the circle doesn't intersect the origin, circles have to map to circles. So 
we think that the sides are intersecting at 90 degrees over uh, the, the picture? The other yeah, one? yeah. So this, the sides, that's right. This is a conform from amortization. So if you were to locally uh, look at these angles, they should still be 90 degree angles. Okay. Exactly. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, so. What is the exact map? P goes to. Huh? What is the map? P goes to. P goes to P over P squared. Over the normal P. No, I, I wasn't sure I answered the question. I just read off the slides. So I don't know if that helps you. What is the exact mapping? Uh, if, if you want to think of these as complex numbers, it's the complex number C goes to 1 over C, or 1 over the conjugates. Uh, that's a map of the complex number. Again, the conjugation I'm going to gloss over uh, for reasons of simplicity. Uh, so you are also adding the point at infinity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is in the. This is in the uh, Compactified muscles. So you have one more point that sort of blew the, the planet. You can think of this also as a stereographic projection as a matter of um, So this is interesting but not useful uh, because if I look at this map and see what it does to points on the unit circle, it maps them back to himself. So that's not so interesting. Yes? It's a small confusion. So this is angle preserving but not conformal. This is angle preserving. Uh, so now I have to remember if conformal means orientation preserving or not. If conformal means orientation preserving, it's not because of the conjugate. The conjugates are required to make things angle preserving, but we don't care so much. It may not be conformal in this case. Yeah, I have to remember is if the technical definition of conformality, well, conformality is like, just angle preservation. Uh, right unless, I'm, unless I'm mistaking something, it seems like this is a z-bar dependence. Sorry? This has a z bar yeah. dependence, it's looking a bit. It has a what dependence? This has a conjugate dependence, so it can't be conformal for the right? because it's Because, well, it's, so it does, it, it, that does incorporate a reflection. But the reason we don't care is that the reflection happens perpendicular to the direction of the circle. In the circle itself, there's no reflection. And since we're looking, we're going to look to restrict this to the circle or to the sphere, uh, we can ignore the conjugation. <laughs> Again, it, I'm glossing over this a little bit. <laughs> Uh, okay, so this is not so useful because it takes the acts sort of trivially on the unit circle, but of course what we can do is look about uh, inversions about other points. We're essentially inverting about the point minus C. This still takes, uh, this is still a conformal map. Uh, it still takes circles to circles. Uh, it doesn't take the unit circle to the unit circle, but since it takes circles to circles, what we know is that with the appropriate scaling and translation, this becomes a map from the circle, or even the unit sphere, to itself. So this is what we're going to use to represent inversions of the sphere into itself. So it's this conformal map. It takes a, a priori, it just takes a circle to some other circle, but you can always translate or scale that target circle so that it's back to the unit circle, which is what we're doing. So here's your scaling term, and here's your translation term. If you're on the sphere, this will always map you back to this one. Okay. Good? All right. If we look at this, first thing we're going to notice is that if we take the center of inversion, the point C, to be the origin, this is just the identity map. This is 1. Uh, this is 0. P is on the sphere. So the norm of P is going to be 1. This is 0. So P just maps to itself. Perfect. And what we want to ask, what we're going to try and understand a little bit, is what happens as I move this center of inversion off of the origin? What happens to points on the sphere? How do they move? Yep. So I'll just take the derivative of this map, which I can do. Uh, and I'll get this equation over there on the right. You can derive this. It's not so hard. Uh, fine. Okay. Now, what is this map? This is the identity. P is a point on the sphere. We're taking the outer product. So this is the projection. This is an operator that takes the projection onto the plane perpendicular to P. So what is that saying? One way to tra translate this is if I move my center of inversion off of the origin in the direction of C, a point P on the sphere will look will move in the direction of C projected onto the tangent plane at P. That's describing the motion of points on the sphere given a particular center of inversion. We 
okay with that? Can you say that one more time? Sure, 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 sure. sure. Uh, so this is saying, right, if I look at sort of what the derivative of this, right, as a function of c, sort of, right, um, this is telling me the position of the point p. What this should, should tell me is if I make a change in some direction, if I move my center of direction, how does the point p change? How does the position of the point change? And what this is saying is when I apply this to the direction in which I'm moving center of inversion, I'm just taking that direction, I'm projecting it onto the tangent plane of the point P and moving P along that. So let me... It's, it's C is on the sphere or something? C, no, inside the sphere. Oh, inside. And C is the center of inversion. It's anywhere in the sphere. P is on the sphere. Uh, okay. So let me show you a visualization perhaps it will make it clearer. I'm going to take a point. So C is at the origin right now. Uh, so we have this mapping of the sphere. And I'm going to move C up this axis. We're going to look at what's going to happen as we apply this inversion. And what's happening is as I move the center of inversion up the North Pole, I'm dragging sort of the sphere upwards in the same direction. And if I look at the vector field that describes the sort of this instantaneous motion, then what is this vector field? It's just the up director projecting onto the sphere, which is to say at every point on the sphere, I take the up direction. Projected. So it vanishes over here, obviously at the poles, and it's the fastest move. And that gives us a sort of a differential understanding of how inversions act on this one. This will be important. So let me stop here and ask if there are questions. Does this picture make sense? So the map that you had before, it's identity only on the sphere. This map, yeah, this when c is equal to zero. zero yeah, only on zero. Because again, our goal was to define an inversion technically that acts on the ambient space, but we're only interested in the action on the sphere. Sure. Um, okay, good. No? Okay. Um, okay, so that's the first thing I need to understand a little bit about what inversions are. The other thing that I need to talk about is conformal factors or stretch factors. In general, you have a map from some surface to the sphere. You can ask about its scale factor. So what is that? That says, take a look at a point on the sphere, or a small area in, on the sphere. And what is the ratio of the area around this point to the area of the surface that lives over it on the surface? How much is area scaling as a mapping? And that'll give us a function on the sphere. Here I'm drawing in red regions where the scale factor is large. There's a lot of area on the surface sitting over a small area on the sphere, in blue where it's not so large. So this is for a fixed, uh, a fixed radius of the... Yeah, so they, I mean, you can do this infinitesimally. You take the ratio of areas. Right? For any radius around the point, you can talk, talk about the ratio. And that's the scale factor. So far so good? You know that there's no singularity in your map. In my map, do I know that there's no singularity? Uh, yeah, let's say yes. In the continuous case, I This is uh, Riemann's theorem, the Riemann mapping. It tells me that there's, there's a conformal ground condition. In the discrete case, there be, could be issues. But for now, I'm going to assume that scale factors are neither zero nor infinite. That, that's what you're asking. So the answer is. Let's assume yes. I can't actually make that wrong. Uh, good. Now, here's the thing. I can take a different conformal parameterization, right? So maybe this is a different conformal parameterization of my surface to the sphere. That gives me different scale factors, or conformal factors. Conformal factors, not the same form. And what you can do is you can look at what happens to these conformal factors. Right? So I'm sort of just rotating the sphere around so you can see the conformal factors from all sides. And hopefully, what you're convinced of is that somehow these guys are better than these guys. In the sense that here they tend to be all clustered up together, right, the conformal factors. And here they're somehow more uniformly distributed. And that's our intuition. Our intuition is sort of if we had to choose a particular spherical parameterization, we would opt for this one. Because the conformal factors are more uniformly distributed. We'll make that concrete in just a moment. So that's going to be our goal. Our goal is going to be, of all possible uh, parameterizations, sort of 
given that we have a choice in terms of spherical inversions, we want to choose the one that makes the mass as uniformly distributed as possible. So how do you measure this? Well, what you can do is you can walk around the sphere. Every point is some point at three dimensions. And you can take the weighted average of the points on the sphere, but with weights not given uniformly, because that's going to be trivial to your origin, unit sphere centered at origin, with weights given by these scale factors. So for any point on the sphere, I'm going to say, well, how much mass sits over it on the original surface? And that's going to be the weight that I'm going to ascribe to this point because I'm taking the weight of it. So here's the claim. The claim is there is a unique Mobius inversion that, place, that you can apply that places this center of mass at the origin. And it's actually easy to calculate. That's it. And what is our approach? Our approach to doing this is going to be gradient descent. Right? So what we have is uh, we have the center of mass. And we can say, if we apply an inversion about some point, see how is that going to change the center of mass. We want to look at sort of the gradient of this operator, this, this mapping. In particular, uh, the claim is that if I have <laughs> a parameterization right, with scale factors on it, right, so I have the scale factors, uh, and I look at the function that sort of gives me a new parameterization as I change the center. So it gives me the center mass as a function of the center of inversion. The Jacobian of that map is given by this thing. And this thing is something that you've already seen before, right? This, this had to do with um, the differential of the inversion map. We, but we'll work this out. It'll be okay. okay. So let's have this set up. We have our conformal parameterization here. We have its scale factors, and we are going to apply some inversion about some center C. We're going to have the scale factors associated to that inversion. So we can ask, what is the center of mass of this thing? Well, the center of mass is exactly what we said. You know, sum over the points on the sphere weighted by the scale factors over here. Good. So far, so good. But what can I do? I can ask the following thing. If I look at this point over here, right, and I happen to know it, listen, maybe I know it comes from here. What is this scale factor? What is the value of this scale factor? Well, there's two things. It's the scale factor of this guy. Right? Sort of, if I go backwards along the map, multiplied by how much area is changing as I move from here to here. Right? It's the product of the scale factor. Okay. It's going to look like that. So I can plug this into my equation, which looks ugly until you realize that you, know, you can do a change of variables. And now what you have is you have something very nice. You have an expression for your center of mass as a function of the center of inversion C, which only depends on the original scale factors, not on the new scale factors. You pulled the whole transformation to, to, the, uh, to the point. <coughs> That's that. Uh, and so now we want the differential of that. Well, the only thing that's a function of C is this guy. We already know what the differential is of the inversion map. Right? We, we know that it's this guy. So we plug that in. That gives us our decoder. Isn't it actually an integral of the surface itself, the original surface? Uh, sorry, is who? Mu. Mu? Can you, can you make a change of variable back to the, the rabbit? Can I make, uh... Because lambda is a Jacobian determinant. So I could. Lam lambda is certainly you know, talking about the original surface. This, yeah. is, this is all about the rabbit here. But the P is on the sphere. So that's sort of this coupling of the sphere and the rabbit. So I can't, I can't, I can't quite pull it. Well, if you could. Yeah, the inverse, so, yeah. But then, yeah, yeah. Um, good. Good. So we have our Jacobian. Everybody's good with this Jacobian? So again, what is our goal? We have this energy given a particular center of inversion, which says, how far is the center from the origin? What is the square norm of the center? Right? That's the energy we're trying to minimize. Well, if we want to minimize it. Let's take the Jacobian of this energy. The Jacobian of this energy is just the Jacobian of mu, or Jacobian of mu transpose times mu. Now, we know what the Jacobian of mu is. 
And, well, what is this? This operator over here, right? This is the projection operator on the tangent space of people. It's a symmetric, positive, semi-definite operator. Right? It, it, it's, it, it's singular in the direction of P, and it's full rank in the perpendicular direction. And we're taking these guys summed up over the spheres with positive weights. Well, what does that mean? This means that this thing over here, the Jacobian, is actually a symmetric, positive, definite matrix. If it's symmetric and positive definite, the only way for the gradient to vanish is if the center of mass is actually at the origin. Which is to say, we can just do gradient descent, we will get to a local minimum, and that local minimum is not a local minimum, it's a global minimum, and it's in particular, it actually places a center of mass at the origin. That's the existence. The uniqueness proof is easier. Questions about this? conformal parameterization and its center. What we want to show is that if we apply an inversion about some point C, it can't be centered. That's just not possible. Right? Well, what does it mean for it to be centered? It means that you know, if I look at some direction C, there's as much mass on one side as there is on the other. It's sort of balanced. Right? This is in terms of moments of inertia. Okay. But what happens if I apply an inversion in the direction of C? I'm shifting the mass upwards towards C. So if it was centered to start with, it can't possibly be centered after I apply this inversion. There is no second inversion I can apply that is going to preserve the property of centeredness. centeredness. Being centered is unique. So this is, okay, we haven't gotten to the fun part. The fun part's ahead of us. Um, in terms of implementation, six lines of code. Literally trivial tense. I'm assuming I'm giving, given a triangle mesh with triangles T and vertices V. And so this is a triangle mesh, a triangulation of the sphere. But at each triangle, I have information. What is the area of that triangle when it was on the surface, when it was on the bunny? Right, so that's my conformal factor. And I'm given some threshold F. And what I want to do is I want to get a centered sphere. So what do I do? First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to compute my center of mass. Well, what do I do to that? We're going to sum over the points on the sphere weighted by normal factors. In this case, I'm going to sum over the points on the triangle. I'm going to take the center of the triangle, which could be just the mean, or it could be the mean shifted back to the sphere, whatever you want, times the area. That's the conformal factor uh, multiplied times the uh, area term on the sphere itself. If the center of mass is close enough to the origin, then we're done. Nothing to it. Otherwise, I'm going to compute the Jacobian. And what is the Jacobian? Well, it's just the sum of these projection operators. Again, I'm going to project at each point onto the perpendicular point on the sphere, weighted by the conformal factors. Just to sum over the triangles, uh, I'm going to use uh, this to get my 